as I was leading up to the last several weeks, we're going to get um, right into our theme for this new year. And our theme for this new year is reckless love. The reckless love that God has shown every one of us. And so just to, to give a little bit of reminder, last year we focused a lot on getting back to the basics of our faith, getting back to the basics of our building a relationship with Christ, um, getting back to the basics of what we're called to do. Um, and so going into this year, um, the vision and the purpose of Refuge Church is to get back to the basics of where we are and who we are in Christ. And what is our MO or our mission objective from Christ? And that is to go out into the world and to make disciples, to provide a place of shelter and safety and comfort to those that are lost and that are searching and that don't know Christ so that they can have a place to come and learn and grow and mature. Um, and then they can go out and bring more back. And it's this constant cycle of rescuing and bringing home and rescuing and bringing home and rescuing and bringing home. It's a constant rescue mission for heaven. And that is what we are on um, just in general. So last year we focused on these things. We talked um, a little bit about how we start and rebuild our, our relationship or build right from the ground up with Christ. We talked about eternity, what it is and what it is not. We talked about the realities of heaven and the realities of hell um, and that every person on this earth is going to have to make a choice one day. We also talked about prayer, what prayer meant and what it looks like. We've also talked going into the holiday season about Advent. We talked about hope and peace and joy and love. And so now... To start uh, this year, like I said, our focus will be reckless love. And so it asks, I, I, I kind of was going into this going reckless. What, is, what does that mean? Because it usually has a pretty negative undertone to it. And so reckless, as I'm talking, is something that's radical, something that is selfless, something that is spirit-filled and dependent on God. God is not reckless. But the way in which he loves us and grants us grace is reckless. In 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 10, it tells us what love is. And so I'm going to read that and just, if you would, close your eyes and just kind of think. And when you hear love is, replace the word with yourself. Take an inventory right now as we're beginning this. And so it says, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always preserves. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. If you drop down a few more verses, it tells us the greatest of all things is love. Sometimes we get wrapped up in exactly what love is and what it is not. Sometimes we think enabling each other is love feel bad or we want to make it all better. Um, sometimes you have to understand that we have tough love too. <laughs> it's a love that we love and we'll always be there and we'll keep our ar arms open. But there are certain things that we'll just have to be answered for. There are certain consequences that come with actions that we have, even if, even if someone loves us, right? So we know the song, Reckless Love. We've sang it here um, during our worship time. And a man named by, by the name of Corey Ash Asbury is one who wrote that song. And when he was asked about the song, he said, um, as far as what he meant by reckless, and he says this, what I mean is he is utterly unconcerned with the consequences of his actions with regard to his own safety, comfort, and well-being, speaking of God. His love isn't crafty or slick. It's not cunning or shrewd. In fact, all things considered, it's quite childlike. And might I even suggest, sometimes downright ridiculous. His love bankrupted heaven for you. His love doesn't consider himself first. 
His love isn't selfish or self-serving. He doesn't wonder what he'll gain or lose by putting himself out there. He simply gives himself away on the off chance that one of us might look back at him and offer ourselves in return. And this is how we, we must love. We are told that we are called to love each other as Christ loved the church. And if Christ loved the church in this radical and selfless, and as uh, Corey Asbury says, at times downright ridiculous way to just keep loving and keep loving, and keep loving. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what you've said. It doesn't matter where you went. He's just going to keep loving you. And this is the way we here need to love those out there. So it brings me back to, if we are looking to do a continuous rescue mission, we need to love those enough to go and rescue them, and to pull them back, and show them that there is a lighthouse, that there is a, a strong and mighty fortress to take refuge under. We must be all in. And to lead us down this path of learning to love recklessly, throughout this year we'll be walking through the Gospel of John. Commentators and biblical scholars report, refer to the Gospel of John as the beloved Gospel of the Church. John focuses on and spends time unpacking some of the most real some of the most intimate, some of the most relatable pieces of the story. Some of the most genuine and real interactions that people had with Christ. They got them down to the nitty gritty of what is it to be human? What is it to live this life and walk the journey that we walk and John brings many of these moments that people have had with Christ to the surface for us to look back on and for us to fully understand what this love of God is all about, this reckless love. Remember, God, when he calls us to do something, doesn't leave us with a big question mark to figure it out for ourselves. It's right here in this book he gave us um, of exactly what he's talking about. What does he mean? It's all right here. So along this walk, we'll come across Jesus' interaction with a man named Nicodemus, a Pharisee searching for truth, even when all the others didn't want to hear it. We'll uh, see Jesus' encounter and discussion with a woman at a well who was shamed, who um, he should have not been talking to for all intents of cultural and, and racial perspectives. Um, Jesus meets the request of a young man, man named Thomas, who is just looking for an encounter with his risen Christ. And so many more. And in order to grasp the impact and full implication of God's love for us, we must first flip back into the history of God's people, which would be the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, we find a book called Hosea. And you know, there's many um, instances throughout the Old Testament, the New Testament, that we can pull examples out of God's love and God's renewal and God's forgiveness and God's second, third, fourth, fifth, sixteen hundredth chance, right? And the reason why I landed, and I think the reason why the Lord just placed Hosea so heavy laying on my heart, is for people that don't know Hosea, Hosea was chosen by God to speak to his people about their fall from grace, their wicked, persistently wicked behavior, but not only to warn them and to let them know that judgment and consequence was coming, not might come, not you can change it, but it was in fact on its way. He also told the people how God would restore them and reconcile them back to him. You see, God had already made a plan for them to be restored before he even allowed the consequences to happen. He does that many, many with us all the time, right? He's already got it figured out. He says, hey, this may have happened, and these consequences may have to be faced, but I've already seen you through it. You've just got to get from point A to point B so that you can see point C. And so he takes Hosea, and he asks Hosea, he makes a request of Hosea, that I'll be honest with you, church, I don't know how I would have responded. I really, really, truly don't. 
However, it shows us part of the nature and character of Christ and how he interacts with us, his creation, with one another. So how the Lord uses us to reach and interact with each other for all, for the glory of him. For the reconciliation and restoration back to glory with him. And so, God asks Hosea to make a practical choice that would cause him pain, mistrust, deception possibly. But the reason why he was asking Hosea this was so that Hosea could relate to God in such a way that when he spoke to God's people, he could feel what God was talking about. And so sometimes God asks us to go out on a limb to face some pain, to face some persecution, to face some uncertainty, to face some type of thing that this is not an effect of any cause that you may have committed. He's just saying, I'm going to request this of you to draw you closer to me so that you can draw others closer to me. And so what God asked of Hosea, he told Hosea to go out and get married to a prostitute or to a promiscuous woman. That's how you church. I don't know if I would have been okay with this one. Or do you want me to do what? With who? How and when? It is a request that makes you to have to stand back and go, are you really asking this of me? And that's okay. It's okay when the Lord calls us into something that seems so radical and so selfless, and so illogical that we have to take a step back and go, Lord, we need to talk. Because that's what God wants. He wants to talk to you about the mission he has planned for you. He wants to let you know the details before you take it up and raid the enemy or take it up to prepare somebody else for battle. He wants that discussion. So that's okay. It's okay to take a minute and go, Lord, is this from you? Scripture tells us to test the spirit. To know that they are from God. God would not tell us and recommend in his book for us to do that if he had a problem with us doing it or if he didn't expect us to need to do it. So it's okay. In fact, I would say if you ever feel that you have to talk to God and ask for confirmation and there's something in your ear going, who are you? Let me tell you now, that's the enemy lying to you because he doesn't want you talking to God. He doesn't want you to confirm God's plan in your life because he'd rather you go, no, nope, that's not God. I'm going to keep trucking. Because the enemy is never concerned about you. He's not concerned about losing one to God. But he's worried about the hundreds and the thousands and the ten thousands that may come to Christ because of your interaction with the living God. That's what he's worried about. That's what he cares about. No offense, you are all individually special and precious to God, but to the enemy, you are just a number. You are just one to cause the rest of the pillars to fall. And if he can knock you out to knock the rest of them out, all the better. So Hosea is asked this. And Hosea is obedient to God. And God goes through the reason he said he wants him to take a promiscuous woman so that he could see just as Israel fell and adultered to God and disobeyed and was unfaithful to God, God wanted Hosea to relate exactly what his people were doing to him as Hosea walked this life with this promiscuous woman and had children by her. God even says, I want you to take this promiscuous woman so that there are children that are illegitimate. I want there to be a real life, practical example of what my people are doing to me. And he chose Hosea and requested Hosea because he had already planned to restore Hosea. He had already planned to restore this relationship with this promiscuous woman, and Hosea did. And so my main point is we want to know reckless love and we want to see it. So if we look in chapter 4 of Hosea, 1 and 2, Here's um, a list of things that the Lord had against Israel right now. Some of the things that Israel was grieving God with. The things that were um, bubbling up anger within God's spirit. 
the way they're treating him. And in chapter 4, it says, Hear the word of the Lord, you Israelites, because the Lord has a charge to bring against you who live in the land. There is no faithfulness, no love, no acknowledgement of God in the land. That means they didn't even give credit that God was there. There was only cursing, lying, murder, stealing, and adultery. They break all bounds, and bloodshed follows bloodshed. They break all bounds. What he's saying here is that there wasn't anything the Israelites were not willing to get involved in. All these people that would conquer them or take them over or take them captive, one of the things the Israelites always fell into the trap of was taking their women, making illegitimate children, and falling off into worship of some idol. And you know what the funny or the ironic part is, is that the Israelites didn't even need another person to do this, because as they sat down waiting for Moses to come off the mountain, all they had was each other, and they still built a calf to worship. I mean, how long was Moses gone? A month? It took a month for them to forget Egypt and all the ways that God saved them. Didn't get them to forget all the luxuries of Egypt, does, does it? How many times has the enemy come with us going, remember that sin you were involved in that you gave up for God, right? How much more fun was that? How much better of a place were you in? How much more money did you have? He never reminds you of the pit of despair that you ended up in because you had no hope beyond the surface of whatever financial stability you may have had or social stability or relationship or whatever it might be. The enemy never tells you to remember those parts. So here in chapter 4, the Lord tells the Israelites he's got a charge to bring against them. And he lists all of these things that the Israelites are falling into. Then in chapter 5, 1 through 7, he takes it even further. And not only is it the Israelites, but he talks to the Israelite leaders, the high priests, the people that should be keeping these people in line and reminding them of the, of the promises of God and reminding them of the law of God and how they should be walking and why. And he says in chapter 5, Hear this, you priests. He calls them right out onto the carpet. God does not pull punches. He doesn't make it subtle so that there's a confusing question at the end. He is straightforward. He says, Hear this, you priests. Pay attention, you Israelites. Listen, royal house. He's not leaving it up to debate. He ordained them in the positions they were in. And in that ordination, they broke the covenant. Of <coughs> they were disobedient to the point that they were worshiping other gods that did nothing for them. And it says, this judgment is against you. You have been a snare at mitzvah, a net spread out on table. The rebels are knee-deep in slaughter. I will discipline all of them. I know all about Ephraim. Israel is not hidden from me. Ephraim, you have now turned to prostitution. Israel is corrupt. Their deeds do not permit them to return to their God. A spirit of prostitution is in their heart. They do not acknowledge the Lord. It's not that they don't talk to him. It's not that they don't spend time with him. They don't even acknowledge that he exists anymore. That means generation after generation after generation, there was a failure to teach the next generation about the God who brought them out of Egypt, the God who stayed true and faithful to their people. It wasn't just a surface thing. It wasn't like it happened and the men there forgot. They didn't even teach the generations that came after them. There was no acknowledgement of God. Israel's arrogance, it goes on to say, testifies against them. Israel's arrogance testifies against them. It says that you are guilty by your own actions. You don't need anybody to come in against you and point out what you did wrong. I see it. It's obvious. The Israelites, even Ephraim, stumbled in their sin, it goes on to say. Judah also stumbles with them. When they go with their flocks and herds to see the Lord, they will not find him. He has withdrawn himself from them. He said, I am sick and tired of being sick and tired with you. 
I've had it. I'm done. I think as parents, we can all relate to a point where our children have got us to the point that we have to we are done. I am not sure what you got to do, but you better figure it out. Right? You know why I have? I have a 23-year-old, and I know I've been there. Right? I have a four-year-old, and I know I've been there. <laughs> They are unfaithful to the Lord. They give birth to illegitimate children. When they celebrate their new moon feasts, he will devour their fields. They are worshiping the cycles of the moon. It says here, when they celebrate their new moon feasts, that means they were spending more time paying attention to the pagan holidays and cycles of the moon, and it says they wouldn't acknowledge God in their land. So they forgot all about the person who created the moon while they worshipped the moon. That makes sense. But how much is that an ongoing cycle for us as humanity to continue to worship the creation over the creator? How often do we lose sight of the creator who laid out the plan while we worry about if the plan is going to happen? There's an old saying that says, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plan. Your plan. Um, as most of you know, Jennifer and I met at church. Um, and the funny part about that is when I got saved in August of 2013, or more like more accurately when I surrendered my life to Christ finally, um, I had said, Lord, I want a Christian wife. I want a Christian girlfriend. Um, as most of you know, my, or many of you know my story, I, I lived a promiscuous life for a while. Um, I chased the world, everything the world had to offer to fill in some weird shaped void in my life that was in the shape of Christ. Um, and I took everything I could to fill it. But when I finally surrendered my life, I said, all right, Lord, I want a Christian wife. And I want a Christian woman in my life that can keep me focused on you. I want her to care about my relationship with you more than even I care about my relationship with you. Because if I have a spouse that is going to encourage me to get closer to you, then I won't have anything to worry about. And God, this is wonderful, but I don't want to meet her at church. That's where I draw my line, Lord. We're cool? Awesome. And there's Jennifer playing the keyboard on stage at church. There was just something, something. And the funny part about that is Jen, who has lived her Christian life since she was little in the church, playing keyboard and kept true to God's, God's rules and commands and, and really lived a way that would be pleasing to him. She said, Lord, I want a Christian man, but I don't ever want to be a pastor's wife. <laughs> Well, as you can see, Jennifer and I are married um, with our four-year-old, and she is, in fact, the pastor's wife. Um, but all of that to say, our plans are never greater than what God has for us, right? And so, getting back to the wayward Israelites here in Hosea, God's putting them out in the carpet here. And he's calling them out for the things they're doing. And he's telling them, hey, this is the charge, right? He never tells us he's got something against us. Or he never, we never face consequences just for his enjoyment. And why is this important, especially when we read the Old Testament? And that's because ancient Near East religions, and pretty much any religion, if you go across the world at that time and even today, little g gods would punish and reward their people at a win. Because it was Tuesday. There was no, they had no reason. They had nothing that told them what made their gods happy, what made them upset, how do you make them happy once they are upset. That's why you see um, ancient religions, the Aztecs and all, they slaughtered children to appease the gods. They spilt, I, I believe one says, 20,000 children in three days at one point, I think they found, to appease what they thought was a God that was upset with them. When we really give a minute to think about the reality of the words I just said, how many babies are being slaughtered across the United States in some sick and twisted form of worship to today's culture? These centers go up and you notice they go up in communities and the communities quickly fall apart because they're destroying the family literally, piece by piece. Literally tearing the next generation to pieces before they leave the womb. 
It's, it's heart-wrenching, but I challenge any and every Christian. Watch. Look at pictures of what these procedures that they call medical procedures are about. Make it real to yourself. Understand what's actually going on in those rooms. There is more than enough um, videos that have been taken in secret of the sonograms and the x-rays or whatever they, the sonograms, they look in there, of them happening. You can see the baby pulling away from these instruments. You can't tell me it's a random sack of cells that knows pain is coming. It's a living, breathing, God-ordained life. And so here we see again, these Israelites are clinging to pagan religions and idols and Sorry, it wasn't a statue of a wooden whatever that got you out of Egypt, Israelites. It wasn't that who parted the Red Sea for you, Israelites. So we go down further into Hosea, into chapter 8. And it tells them, the Israelites now, told them what the Lord had against them. And now it tells them what the consequence will be. So again, as I said in the beginning... These are consequences that the Israelites will face. It's not, I'm warning you, I'm warning you, I'm warning you. No, this is what you did. This is what's going to happen. So he says in chapter 8, starting in verse 3, But Israel has rejected what is good. An enemy will pursue him. They set up kings without my consent. They chose princes without my approval. With their silver and gold, they make idols for themselves to their own destruction. Have you ever noticed, and you can actually, I believe it's over here in the one in Ro- uh, Order of Robinsville House, and if you ever go to a Planned Parenthood, they actually have a statue of what's called women's empowerment. And if you look at this statue, and you look at the idols of old, there is not much difference. It's got a crown that looks like a sun, and it's made of gold. So they're bronze standing out in front of their places. And then you read this. With their silver and gold, they make idols for themselves to their own destruction. You don't think we make idols like calves? They may not be in the shape of a cow, but we make them. And we worship at the feet of them. And we do what people say we need to do with them to be in the in crowd and not lose a job and not lose <coughs> friends and not lose family and not lose whatever other earthly thing we cling to. It goes on to say, Samaria, throw out your calf idol. My anger burns against them. Burns against them. How long will they be capable of purity? Not just will they choose not to, but be incapable of purity. They are from Israel. This calf, a metal worker, has made it. It is not God. It will be broken in pieces, that calf of Samaria. They sow the wind and reap the whirlwind. The stalk has no head. It will produce no flower. Were it to yield grain, foreigners would swallow it up. Israel is swallowed up. Now she is among the nations like something no one wants. Those are strong words for the Lord. She is now among the nations like something no one wants. Israel has made herself into something that not even the world would want. But that's exactly where God had to bring the Israelites. You see, he had to break them down. He had to break them down for them to get back to the basics of what it is to have a relationship with him. Because they were filled with all this nonsense And these people on the outside trying to whisper and trying to lead and trying to tempt them away from their God that they encountered in a very real way. It goes on in Hosea in chapter 14. And it speaks of Israel's repentance. And it speaks of God's restorative power flowing over them to pick them up and place them back at the seat of So as I said in the beginning, we see the charges he had on them. We see the consequences he told them they will have to face because of their own decision making. But God already had. He already had it restored. He already had the plan reconciled. He already took everything they did and he said, it'll be okay. You're going to have to go through some stuff. 
to get you to remember and learn about the stuff you shouldn't have been involved in. But when you get on the other side of it, I'm going to be here with my arms open, ready to restore you better than where you were before you fell. That is the reckless love of God. That is the reckless love that Corey Asbury had talked about when he had said he is utterly unconcerned with the consequences of his actions with regard to his own safety, comfort, and well-being. His love is not crafty or slick. It's not cunning or shrewd. In fact, all things considered, it's quite childlike. Remember, he goes on to say, and might I even suggest downright ridiculous. He loves us ridiculously, <laughs> recklessly, radically. Because the other thing that our God did that no other little G God has ever been recorded doing in all of recorded human history, no God has ever chosen to come down to the people who are doing him wrong in order to die so they can be saved. There is no story of any supposed God out there that has ever done that. That was such a radical idea. That was such a radical idea. Not even his own people understood what it meant for Jesus to come here the way he did. And that's why we are starting in John this year. That's why we are going to unpack and walk the journey of the gospel of John. In chapter 1 of John, it states in verse 14, the single greatest act of love in human history, then, now, and ever. And it says, speaking of Jesus, so the word became human and made his home among us. That word home that's used there is the same word that's used in Hebrew when they talk about God resting on the Ark of the Covenant, that his very presence would travel and be with the Israelites at all times. He was coming from earth in his way to sit on the lid of the Ark of the Covenant so that he would be a presence in the Jewish people's lives at all times. He would camp with them. He would travel with them. He would go before them and behind them and around them. And it's that same uh, contexted word where it says, so the word became human and made his home among them. Or among us. It goes on to say he was full of of unfailing love and faithfulness. God was faithful until death and continued to be faithful through resurrection and ascension and until he comes back for us and then comes back with us. Remember when he, the rapture is separate, separate from the second coming, but it says after the rapture has happened and the second coming happens, when God arrives back on this earth, his saints will ride with him. We're coming back with him, y'all. We're going to be riding next to him and singing his praises and glory because we will be an army that never has to lift a finger because it says the sword will come from his mouth and he will strike down the enemies that rise against him. A glorious moment. What a glorious moment. The love of Christ is so unique. There is nothing like it throughout all of human history. Nothing. There isn't a place you could go that shows anything as far as that. <laughs> Sometimes you'll hear me say Buddha is a fat statue. And he is. It's a fat man that sits on people's desks. People may pay attention to him, people may not. That's all he is, is a statue. Muhammad was a man. He was a man. He never died for anybody. And when he died, he never came back. He was a man. But Jesus. Jesus was 100% man and is 100% God all at the same time who loves us in a way that no one on this planet has ever shown love. And yet we are called to love as he loved his church. So we are called to love recklessly. 
you know, speaking of Muhammad, a point that many Muslims I've talked to have an issue with when it comes to Christ is how could God allow himself to be killed? That doesn't make sense. Why would a king come and not rule in a kingdom? Why would a, a coming and waiting Messiah arrive in a manger? Why would he sleep next to pigs and cows? Why would he come to allow himself to be, to be humiliated and, and embarrassed? It just doesn't make sense. And, and honestly, it doesn't. There's no human king in history that ever would have allowed any of that to happen. We saw what happened with Saul when he was told his crown was being taken from him. And he grasped onto it all he had. We saw when the crown infiltrated David's brain. The God after man, or the man after God's own heart, and couldn't handle the responsibilities and the benefits and the stress that came with the crown. We can know this unconditional, radical, and reckless love. We can know this love both as someone who receives it as well as someone who can give it, but only through a personal relationship. Refuge Church is here to offer just that a refuge, as I said in the beginning. It's a place to leave it all at the cross. And as you can see, the cross still stands that we had here on New Year's. And there is a hammer and nails at the base of that cross so that if ever comes a time that there is something you need to leave on that cross, make sure you write it down and nail it to that cross. And that cross will stay there for us to pray over those things for each other, to carry one another's burdens all part of the reckless love that we are called to have. It's not simply a place to go when you're down or scared or need a pick-me-up. A refuge is a place to thrive, to learn, to grow and prepare yourself for what is outside the walls of the refuge. It's a place to recharge, connect, and call in reinforcements. The first step into bringing people into refuge is to open our doors. You can't welcome people in. You can't rescue people and bring them back if the doors are closed. And the door is not only of a building, but the doors of our heart. Right? If we had the opportunity to save someone that we know is, is evil and is just doing the wrong thing and is against God, if we were given that opportunity where God said, I want you to welcome them in your doors, what would we do? It? Because there was a man that was called on to do that for a man named Saul. Saul was on, his, on the road to Damascus and when the Lord came upon him and covered his eyes with scale, he uh, told another Christian to say, hey, Saul is on his way. You're going to open your doors and welcome him in. And he went, who? Because everybody knew who Saul was. You mean that man that's slaughtering Christians, Lord? Do you mean that man that's burning down villages and, and not taking prisoners? Do you, mean, do you mean that Saul, Lord? You want me to do what? And then Saul goes on to write the majority of the New Testament. He makes a radical change in his life from slaughtering to saving. We must love as Jesus loves in order to be a place of refuge for those who are hurting, for those who are lost, those who are searching, those who need rest, those who desire to learn, grow, mature, for those, fill in blank. We all need a refuge. God is the refuge for his people. <coughs> so as we take all this in, our focus this week, number one, if you can, read Hosea. It's not long. Read Hosea. Get an idea of exactly what we as humanity has put the Lord. And then as we go in to start reading John, remember what we're reading, the encounters, the experiences, this perspective that John has as the disciple of love, that he sees this relationship, this intimate time with Christ as sacred, as something that will never um, be surpassed. He just wants to draw closer and closer to Christ that he picks up on these stories that even some of the other gospels don't. He sees this radical, this selfless, this reckless love of Christ that he has for this humanity 
that I remember John, being a good Jewish boy, would have known all about the story of Hosea. He would have known all about the waywardness of the Israelites, and he would have known all about the restorative and reconcili reconciliatory power of God. So let's read Hosea. Read ahead in John. We will take it piece by piece throughout the year. Try to insert it into your weekly reading. Let us focus on what and how exactly God loves us recklessly. Take it individually. Take it personal. How has God loved me recklessly? Before I go and say, I can't love that person that way, think about how God could have said, I don't think I can love you that way. He could have. Heck, he should have in many cases. But he didn't. And that's what matters. He didn't. Pray for the Lord to choose a person. This is what I'm going to ask everyone of, including myself and Jennifer. So this is, a, a, this is a blanketed thing for all of us. Pray for the Lord to choose a person for you to love recklessly this year. To focus in on them, even if they never know it. Even if they have no idea. Even if it's something you don't know. Maybe they cut you off in traffic. Maybe they did you wrong somehow. Maybe they did somebody else wrong. Or maybe it's someone that you just see as lost and is just rejecting any help. Whatever it might be, whatever recklessly looks like for you, ask the Lord to, sh to choose. Not you to choose. For Him to choose. Who you need to love recklessly this year. Start with one. And maybe two. Maybe the Lord will lead you to a group of people you need to love recklessly. And when he reveals that person, just begin to pray. You don't need to wiggle your life away into their life the lights right away. You don't have to know much about them. Just pray. Just pray for them. And remember, we have read in Scripture already a couple times that when we don't know what to pray, the Spirit will pray for us. So don't be concerned with, Lord, I don't know anything about them. I don't know their name. I don't know what they need. I don't know what they've been through. It doesn't matter because you know what? There are people that have prayed for all of us. Not knowing what we're going through. Not knowing if it matters. So let's let that be our weekly focus this week. As we move into the new year. Into our new theme of loving recklessly in 2023. Let's be ready to welcome in those who need rescuing. Those who need a place of rest. Of recharge. Of reconciliation. Of just a safe place to be. Sometimes that's all it is. We just need to sit somewhere and just be. Let's be ready to welcome these people with open arms, no matter what they've done, no matter where they've been, no matter how they've rejected God, even how they may have rejected you. Invite them anyway. Talk to them anyway. Pray for them anyway. And then maybe at the end of the year, maybe they'll be here with you 